This evening, uh, we're returning to the subject of the fear of the Lord. We're going to look at another passage uh, in the book of Proverbs, uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, but what I'd like to do is read verses uh, 1 uh, through 8, again, reminding us of how we ought to conduct our lives in a way that would be honoring to the Lord, again, since that's what He made us for, that's what He redeemed us for, that's what our hearts tell us to do because we love Him, uh, then we should welcome uh, this uh, knowledge on how we can do that. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, Solomon writes by the inspiration of the Spirit, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. May the Lord again bless His word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now again, we started off this morning by considering another important characteristic that we should be cultivating in our lives if we are to be pleasing to the Lord and useful to Him, and that is the fear of the Lord. Solomon told us that this fear is really the starting point of knowledge, of wisdom. Uh, true wisdom, as we saw, is not knowing how to please ourselves uh, through, um, well, through the things the Lord either allows or forbids us to do. The Bible calls that sin, it calls it selfishness, foolishness, idolatry. The true wisdom is really in knowing how to please the Lord and how to find our joy in pleasing Him. Now we saw this morning for the unbeliever that fear is that, that leads him to this godly wisdom is the fear of judgment. Now, to learn about His holiness, to learn about His justice, the fact that God takes sin seriously that He will call every infraction, every breaking of His law into account. Unless you learn the terrors of His justice, that the Lord literally will cast those who sin against Him and who do not repent into a fiery hell forever, you'll never run to Jesus for safety, who alone has satisfied the justice of God. So the true wisdom for the unbeliever in learning the fear of the Lord is to learn the fear of His justice and His wrath and to turn then from your sins to Christ, to run to Christ for safety, to flee from the wrath to come and to find that safety in Him. But we saw for the believer that this fear is really twofold. First of all, it's a filial fear, that is, the fear of a son or a daughter for a parent. If you are a child of the Lord, there is that fear that we should have of God's fatherly chastisement, which we're going to look a little bit more this evening. But we also saw, secondly, that there should be within us that awful reverence of the divine nature because of the infinite distance that exists between God and us. He is infinitely above us, infinitely great, infinitely holy, and that should bring a certain measure of awe. You know how it is when we see those who have authority and those who have great power at their disposal. It does cause a certain measure of fear in our hearts because of what they might be able to do to us, certainly awe in their presence. But when that authority and when that power is infinite and the character of that individual infinitely holy, it should cause holy reverence. It should cause a, a holy dread of that being. And again, we're so used to hearing about God's love today and viewing Him as purely grace that we have, I think, in a large measure, lost the fear of the Lord. But we do need to remember that God will be feared. Uh, 
Jesus tells us that our fear of Him should really eclipse our fear of, of any other being, and especially man, as we saw in our meditation this morning. Jesus said to His disciples, in order to give them the, the, uh, the motivation they needed to go out and to preach in the midst of their enemies, He says, don't fear them, don't fear those, the men who might kill your body but really can't touch your soul but rather fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And again, as we read in Luke, Jesus says, yes, I tell you, fear Him. Paul tells us in our meditation this evening that we must work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who is at work in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. In our memory verse for this week, I'm not sure how many of you are looking at those memory verses and memorizing them, but I'm trying to find, of course, the best verses that will go along with what it is we're looking at. But the Lord tells us in Isaiah 66, 2, that He will not regard us unless we humbly and penitently fear Him. He says, but to this one I will look, to Him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. If we read the word of God and we don't tremble, we do not have the fear of the Lord in our hearts. If you're not afraid of God, then you really don't know Him. That's one of the things you ought to be seeking to do as you read the word of God is to get to know Him and see what He is like and to know that He really is one to be feared. One other thing I wanted to bring up, of course, too, is the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ being our perfect example was also our example in this. Though we may not necessarily see it in the Gospels as we read about the history of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, actually the Lord tells us through Isaiah that this is exactly what Jesus was like. We read in Isaiah chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Now, who is this referring to? But our Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the one who not only had the spirit of the fear of the Lord upon him, but he actually delighted in it. And as our example, we need to follow him in this. Now, why is it so important that we fear the Lord? Well, Solomon gives us a couple of reasons in our passage. Now, we've already seen, you know, what these things are, and actually we're going to apply some of these things this evening. As far as, you know, who God is, the divine nature, and the fact that He is our Father who will discipline us. But Solomon wraps those two ideas together in the fear of the Lord, and he tells us, for one thing, it will help us to turn away from evil. It will help us not to do the things we should not be doing, but rather the things we should be doing. It's a motivation to do the will of God. And secondly, it will bring God's healing if, in fact, we have sinned and He is disciplining us because there are consequences for sin. When God disciplines, He knows how to discipline. When He does, sometimes it is physical, sometimes it's spiritual. But it always hurts like discipline does, and it will always bring us into the path of blessing. And if we turn from our sins, the Lord will heal us. So first of all, it's important that we fear God because it will help us turn from evil and do the right thing. Solomon says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Now, why would he even have to tell us that? I mean, isn't it just go without saying that that's what we ought to be doing? Well, it is, but sadly, too often our minds don't work this way because of the sin in our hearts. Too often we think that somehow we know better than God or that what He says perhaps isn't the best thing or that somehow He got it wrong and we got it right. Right? 
you know, we can know it's God's Word and somehow we can still think we are wiser than God. That's how deceitful sin can actually be. We do need to remember that even as believers, we still have to contend with sin. Sin living in our hearts and that sin is the desire to break God's commandments. That sin is hatred against God. That sin is opposed to everything that God loves, to everything He wants for you, to everything that is good for you, which is why the Lord tells us over and over again in His Word that you must not trust your own hearts or blindly do what it inclines you to do because perhaps more often than not, your heart is going to mislead you. And that's because of sin. If, if our hearts were purely gracious, then perhaps we could follow them. But it's not the case. And so we have to be aware of what our hearts may incline us to do. Well, how can we guard ourselves against the things that it would incline us to do that we shouldn't be doing? Well, first of all, again, realize you can't trust it. So don't trust it. Don't trust your own wisdom. Don't trust your own understanding. Don't even trust your own subjective impressions of what you think God wants you to do. Rather, trust what God says. He says in verses 5 through 7 of the text we've just read in Proverbs 3, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. That's why when Paul wrote to Timothy in the New Testament, he pointed him to the Scripture for his direction and not to his heart, not to his own understanding, not to his subjective understanding of what God may want him to do, but rather to the Word of God. He says, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate equipped for every good work. Uh, the, the problem is that you may be wrong, but God's Word is always going to be right. So you need to compare what you think He wants to what He actually says that He wants. The two need to agree. Remember what uh, we saw in Pilgrim's Progress when Christian was looking at Bypath Meadows and he was thinking... Well, the path goes the same direction as the path that God wants him to walk on. And he never began to think it was going to lead him out of the way. He was leaning on his own understanding. But what was the clue that should have told him that it was the wrong choice, that it was a bad choice? What was the fact that he had to leave the path in order to walk on the other path? He had actually to go against God's word. But sin can do the same thing to us. It can convince us to go directly contrary to God's will and to make us believe that while we're doing this, we're actually doing something that is pleasing to Him. So Solomon tells us, don't trust your own judgment. Don't trust your subjective impressions, what you think God may be telling you to do. Trust His Word. Whatever you may think, if you leave His path, you will get into trouble. If there's anything we learn from Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, it is that. We need to walk on the path. As a matter of fact, as we go down the path with Christian, we are going to find discipline along the way. Uh, we've already seen a rather significant uh, example of that in Doubting Castle and all that he suffered because he got off the path. Well, secondly, we need to fear God and turn away from evil. How can we make sure that what we are doing is pleasing uh, to the Lord? How can we not lean on our understanding? How can we lean instead on what God tells us to do? The fear of the Lord is meant to help us do that. We need to remember that there are consequences for bad choices that take us off the path. And again, remember who God is and what He is able to do as a means to keep us on the right path. Remember that God is, is holy. Remember that God is just. 
Remember that the Lord will bring every sin into judgment. Now, thankfully, if we've trusted in Jesus, he's brought that into judgment in Christ, and we don't have to suffer for it. But that should not make us not be afraid to sin because God will bring every one of our sins not into judgment against us, but rather he will discipline us for them if we do not turn away. Because he is holy and just, he wants us to live perfectly. Every place we step aside, the Lord's going to be hedging us in. Every place we step off the path, He's going to be disciplining us to bring us back into the path because that is the only way He will allow us to walk because He is holy. And actually, that's a good thing. The Lord has infinite knowledge. Nothing escapes His notice. I mean, He already knows what we're going to do long before we do it. God knows, of course, what we've already done. He knows what we're doing. He even knows what we want to do and why we want to do it. He knows what we're thinking. Even before we speak a word, He knows what it is. Nothing escapes His notice. God has infinite presence. We're never out of His reach. He can always deal with us wherever we are. The Lord has infinite power. He has the ability to call all of His children into account at one time. God is infinite, and of course, being eternal, He is always there and always will be there to require us to do what He calls us to do, and the fact that it never changes means that His standard will always be the same. We do need to remember as we look back at the Old Testament that Israel was God's people, and Israel sinned against the Lord, and there were consequences for their actions. God disciplined them. Sometimes He disciplined them with foreign armies, bringing them in to, uh, to afflict them, or sometimes He even had them carry, carry them out of the land for years at a time. God never changes. He still has the desire that we walk in His ways, and He knows how to get us to do that. Now, how can we believe that these things are true and not be afraid of Him? Not be afraid of offending Him. Well, you know what? Sometimes, again, we know that these things are true. We've heard it so many times, and yet somehow we still don't seem to be afraid of sinning against the Lord. I I know it's true of all of us, but that's because sin will make fools out of us at one time or another. We need to guard ourselves and not be deceived by it. So how do we not lean on our own wisdom and walk in God's ways? Well, the fear of the Lord, the fear of His nature, the fear of what He is able to do, what He knows, what He sees, of His character, and the fact that He will have us walk on the right and good path, that should cause fear. But again, remember that God is your Father, and He is faithful to discipline you. In encouraging the Hebrews not to abandon Jesus, again, as we saw this morning, to go back to the Jewish ceremonial system. In order to save their lives from Roman persecution, the author reminds them of God's discipline. I think perhaps the the most um, straightforward chapter in the whole Bible, at least in the New Testament on this, is in Hebrews chapter 12, where the author to the Hebrews points to Jesus Christ and what he went through in his fighting against sin, and then he encourages them to do the same thing. And he points out, beginning in verse 4, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. I mean, that's the kind of effort we should put into it. And you have forgotten the exhortation, which is addressed to you as to sons, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children." and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? 
Now, notice the author to the Hebrews says that if you want to live, you need to subject yourself to the Lord. And if you don't, then He will bring discipline. And if you don't subject to the, yourself to that discipline, if you don't respond to that discipline in a godly way, then it may be that you don't belong to Him. We must be subject to the Father of spirits if we are to live. Now again, how severe can the discipline of the Lord actually get? Well, you know that God is going to bring exactly what we need in order to break us out of the sin that we have fallen into if we, of course, don't head it off by turning from it ourselves first. Again, in verses 10 through 13 of Hebrews 12, we read this, for they disciplined us, that is our earthly fathers, for a short time as seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good so that we may share His holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Now again, looking at the benefits of discipline, the author to the Hebrews says, therefore, where you've grown weak, where your limbs are, are feeble, you need to strengthen them. In other words, where you've strayed from the path, you need to strengthen your walk and get back on the path. Make straight paths for your feet. If you don't make a straight path for your feet, if you don't get back on the path, what he is saying here is this, that the Lord will intensify His discipline in your life. He says, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint. The difference between, uh, uh, well, a... a um, a lame limb and one that is out of joint, I believe, is moving from something that is bad to something that is worse. The Lord is going to crank up, as it were, the intensity of the discipline to get us to break away from our sins. Now, just how far is God going to go in this? Well, He appears to have disciplined some in the Corinthian church, even to the point of death. I mean, we read this virtually every Lord's Day, don't we? Uh, regarding those who abuse the Lord's Supper. He says here, but a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. Now, why is it that this was happening? Because of God's discipline on them. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. We need to see, of course, that God's purpose behind it is good. He disciplines us so that we won't in the end be condemned. But that discipline could be even to the point of death. Now again, sadly, we can know that all these things are true, we can believe these things are true, and yet we can still do what we know is wrong, either because we've talked ourselves into thinking that what we want to do is really right, it's really what God says we can do, or because we're counting on the fact that God is going to be gracious to us. It doesn't matter if I sin or not, God's going to forgive me. Now, it is true that if you are His, the Lord will be gracious to you, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be smooth sailing because God will discipline you because He's faithful, because He's good, because He's a faithful Father who does what is necessary to get His children to walk in His ways. And the fact that He can do this even to death and the fact that He has the power to do this and the fact that He is as holy as He is and desires that we walk in the good and right way should strike a measure of fear in our hearts that we might turn away from our sins. So why should we fear the Lord? Well, again, because of that threat, as it were, of uh, 
discipline. We should not lean on our own understanding. We should not allow our hearts to lead us away from the Lord. We must turn from evil. Now, what if you have sinned? What if you have been wise in your own eyes? What if you have gotten off the path and you are under His discipline? We've already seen that, um, you know, that discipline could be pretty severe, but does it mean that it's always going to go that far? Is there hope in the Lord if we have fallen under these things? Well, of course, we know there is because God does this that we might learn and that we might actually grow in holiness, that we might become more like Him. God is gracious and He does mean these things for our good. He means it to bring us to repentance and you do need to remember that God is willing to forgive any sin that you are willing to repent of and He's also willing to take away any affliction that He has afflicted you with through His discipline. Remember the author to the Hebrews says that if you will make straight paths for your feet, the limb which is lame will not be put out of joint, but it will be healed. The Lord will remove the discipline if you get back in the right path. Solomon says in our text, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. When the Lord brings discipline for sin, He will remove that discipline when you repent whether the discipline actually comes in a physical or spiritual form. Now, the discipline that Solomon speaks of here looks like it's physical. Maybe it is physical, but it could also be spiritual. Sometimes spiritual affliction is represented in Scripture as, as physical affliction. Uh, David writes in Psalm 51 where he's repenting and lamenting his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and uh, having Uriah put to death, in other words, committing murder. He says in verse 8, Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. And yet as we look at the historic accounts of what happened to David during that time, we don't read that his bones were ever shattered. There were any broken bones at all. But yet he was so grieved in his heart under the Lord's discipline that spiritual affliction felt as though his bones were broken. I think on another instance, he, he refers to them as drying up. You know, that spiritual um, discipline that God brings can sometimes feel like it's crushing our bodies. Now, I don't believe that Solomon or the author to the Hebrews is really telling us that every physical affliction we have is because God is disciplining us. But if it is on account of His discipline, then turning from those sins that caused it will bring healing to our bodies. That's what James also tells us in James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. He says, is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. I, I think you see in here there is the idea of the sins being connected to the affliction. And we need to pray for one another and confess our sins to one another so that we may be healed well, the Lord may afflict us physically for our sins. We need to confess our sins and repent of them in order to be healed. And the same would be true, of course, of any spiritual affliction the Lord might bring as discipline on us for our sins. If we turn away, we will be healed. And so what have we learned from this passage? What have we learned basically from this day? Well, if we are wise in our own eyes and we decide to go our own direction uh, as over against what the Lord would have us to do, God is faithful to discipline us because He is holy, because He is our Father, because, of course, He is also able to do that and He has committed Himself to doing that. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. That's an infinite 
blessing because as we're reminded again by the author to the Hebrews, if we do not receive discipline, then we are illegitimate sons. We do not belong to the Lord. The fact that He disciplines us shows that we actually belong to Him. The fact that He's disciplining us means He cares about us. The fact that He's disciplining us means that He will bring us back into the path of righteousness, and that's exactly where we want to be. That is good. But we've also learned that under that discipline, if we turn from our sins and we get back into the path, the Lord will remove that discipline from us and He will heal and refresh us. Well, that's what Solomon is telling us here. That's what the author to the Hebrews tells us. That's what James is telling us. We need to live in the fear of the Lord. We need to do His will. We need to make sure that we turn from evil. And again, if the Lord is disciplining us, we need to turn from our sins. But let's not forget about the third option, which I think is really what all this is geared toward, which is not recovery from falling into sin so much as it is avoiding sin in the first place. Because if we fear the Lord, if we fear Him enough to keep ourselves from getting off the path in the first place, then we're going to make greater progress in holiness and we're going to be more of the kind of person that the Lord can actually use in this world. One thing that um, I think that, that path that, that Bunyan portrays in Pilgrim's Progress is, is really a path of maturity, I think, as well as, um, well, uh, just the journey that they're on. Every time they get off the path, it costs them time, it costs them effort. They're going to get there, you know, eventually but they would get there more quickly if they just stay on the path. Now, we know that it's impossible to stay perfectly on the path all the way, but I think we'd all have to admit if we put effort into it by God's grace, using the means of grace, and if we fear God and don't allow ourselves to sin and fall so easily that we can make more progress than we're making, and if we do that, then again, we will achieve the goal that we're seeking to achieve as we, well, as Christians, but also as we look at this particular subject, which is how can we be the kind of person that catches God's eye? How can we be the kind of person He will use? How can we be a man, a woman, or a child after God's own heart? Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Don't think that you know better than God. Listen to what God says. Tremble at His Word. Stay in His path. Turn from all evil. And then you will be as useful as you possibly can be to the Lord. And that is the goal of our lives. May the Lord help us, each one of us, to do that. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a few moments of silent prayer and let's ask that He would help us to do that.